guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm greatly honored and pleased to welcome you all to the 10th anniversary Conference of Migration Research Center at Koch University, which focuses on the themes of borders, mobility, and diversity. These three concepts at the title of the conference, Border, Mobility, and Diversity, summarize the three very simple and basic issues that we have learned in migration studies. One, our world is divided by borders, so we are restricted. Two, no matter how hard we cross the borders, so to a certain extent we are mobile. Three, mobility causes diversity. We live in diverse societies. As a result of the ongoing conflict in Syria and Turkey's open door policy, Turkey is now hosting more than 2 million Syrian refugees as of November 2014. While only less than one fifth or 17% of these refugees live in camps, a vast majority of these refugees reside in the different neighbors, neighborhoods of urban areas in many parts of the country. You can imagine that if any country receives an, an unexpected mass flows of two million refugees or migrants, it becomes a real overwhelming development that has long and huge economic, social, political, and cultural implications for the country. Now Turkey debates this migratory picture. Syrian asylum seekers in Turkey are called as guests rather than refugees. It's assumed that they will return home. However, as the conditions get worse and worse in Syria and the conflict becomes a long-term crisis, more and more refugees are crossing into Turkey with no clear prospects for return. Currently, it has become a clear, uh, it, it has become clear that a shift in policy towards longer-term solution is needed. As the temporary stay of refugees is evolving into a type of long-term settlement, it starts to become a subject of social tensions from certain sectors of the population. There are now issues of integration, the questions of temporariness versus permanency in refugee settlements, discrimination and xenophobia, and so on. As we have seen in the case of Syrian refugees in Turkey, global international mobility is increasing incredibly, not only in scale, but also in the types of mobility and the cultural diversity of groups involved in that movement. As a result, more nations and communities have to cope with increased levels of social and cultural diversity. Moreover, the nature of the migration itself is changing so that the lessons of the past with respect of coping with that diversity may, may no longer be appropriate. Experience in some parts of the world suggests that it's extremely challenging to re reconcile the increasing diversity with social harmony and social cohesion. Within this context, this conference will bring together empirical, context-specific debates about the themes of borders, mobility, and diversity on the ground, and theoretical debates about the general concepts and the normative issues raised within migration studies. So it, uh, the Koch University revolves around research, and you can see that we are unknowingly or not also revolving around migration. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this center that Ahmed Bey so beautifully has um, organized and maintained with the support of the foundation is, is one of the best examples that I have seen uh, worldwide of centers which are productive and, and who work at the trenches and actually produce meaningful work that has social impact as well as scholarly value. Turkey today is again going, uh, is, is again the center of very strong, diverse, rapidly changing and challenging migration streams. And I believe that research institutions such as Mirekoc are more needed than ever to contribute uh, evidence for policies in Turkey, but also in the whole Near East, the Mediterranean, and uh, the broader European Union, where we can 
I mean, certainly talk of, uh, speak of a crisis, not only of asylum policies, but migration policies uh, at large. From 1986 to 2010, the U.S. spent around $35 billion in border enforcement, and in so doing, transformed what had been a circular flow of male workers going to three states into a settled population of families living in 50 states, reduced out migration while leaving in migration un unchanged to double the net rate of undocumented migration and population growth, created a population of 11 million undocumented U.S. residents, 60% of whom are Mexican and two-thirds of all, 60% uh, of Mexican immigrants are undocumented and two-thirds of all Central American immigrants are undocumented, all while attempting to end an undocumented flow that would have ended of its own accord after, 19, after 2000 because of the demographic transition in Mexico. Now we have a phenomenon of mass illegality among Latino immigrants in the United States. These are the per estimated percentages illegal in the different um, national origin populations of immigrants. So what do I learn? <clears throat> immigration policy is often made without any regard to the realities of immigration. The first effect was the civil rights movement. Then there was the Latino threat narrative, which fed into the Cold War rhetoric, then the war on terror, and most recently, the threat of Ebola. Immigration policy has powerful effects on patterns and processes of immigration. They strongly affect patterns of departure and return, the geography of entry and settlement. And these effects are often unexpected and unintended. We pushed through our policies a circular process to become a settled process. And we brought about, despite the racist motivations of a lot of the opponents of, of immigration reform, they actually, they actually increased the Latinoization of American society. The future of migration theory, somehow we need to figure out how to incorporate state behavior better into theories of migration. The fundamentals of migration would not predict the outcomes that we observe in the North American migration system. They were a consequence of political decisions that were taken because migrants became a ploy in domestic political discussions, in domestic political debates. Migrants were not important as immigrants. Migrants were important as framing devices. The border became a framing device. But when I started my research on migration on behalf of the state planning organizations in Turkey, in 1963, I never thought that I was pushed into a pit without ground. This is maybe the reason why I called one of my last books, Migration Without End, From Guest Worker to Transnational Citizen. I guess the next edition, in the next edition, I will have to slightly modify the title and add the concept of uh, from guest worker to transnational city and from there to planetary citizen because we have to expect that uh, uh, an avatar, uh, uh, a, a kind of creature uh, is going to come from some planet and uh, uh, will force us uh, also to study who is going to migrate to Mars uh, or, to, or to the moon. Uh, I believe that as long as human curiosity endures, there is no end for scientific research. Much shorter one. Migrants and their spatial movements can be highly integrated in social networks and relations. This could be family, or communal, uh, political, or economic. There are all these kind of networks. I mean, they're integrated in different kind of... But such networks and relations are usually considered in research as external to the receiving society. They're external, not part of the, and they're abstracted from the very functioning and dynamics of receiving society. Migrant integration, again, as operationalized and discussed in the vast research literature, then emerges as a self-contained and autonomous phenomenon. You know, somehow, migrant integration field itself, as a research field, is also pretty much isolated and self-contained from the rest of social sciences. And that I find quite problematic. Of time, I would say that uh, there are, of course, many challenges in, in uh, the region of, uh, of migration. 
Uh, one is to always remember that uh, uh, migration uh, takes place uh, in uh, social structures and processes of uh, um, uh, social, uh, political, and institutional uh, character, uh, but that the structures are in turn uh, changed and transformed by, by uh, migration. And uh, therefore, it is uh, advisable uh, to uh, uh, embed uh, migration in, uh, in global processes of social, economic, and political uh, transformation. And that includes uh, bringing the state back in, as uh, Ari Solberg asked uh, a long time uh, ago. But so if we are to, to take that context and say what determines the form of international migration, then we have to return to Yasmin's question and say, well, fundamentally, the nation state determines international migration. International migration is defined as a passage across international borders. Um, it's clearly a little more than that. It, uh, it requires a certain duration, a certain intention. But one of the, the difficulties of this further categorization is that these things are flexible. So we turn to a, to a broader question of categorization within the mobility approach. I guess the mobility approach itself could be framed as a, as a particular migration theory, but I think of it more in terms of, of an epistemological approach, something which focuses on the nature of categorization. And I think attention to this categorization is, is tremendously important because the ways in which we use the term migration, the term international migration, any of the, the subcategories of migration, that, um, that, that are increasingly common is, is firstly a question of definitions, that we know that whatever the UN population division says is temporary migration and what is permanent migration, that won't really affect how most people use those terms at a, a global level. So people have their own understandings of what is migration and what is movement, what is international migration, what is permanent about migration. So there's a blending of these definitions. It's very difficult to be precise. There's also an empirical blending that, um, that obviously in coming here yesterday from the UK, um, that was an international movement, but it, it wasn't really migration. It was travel of some form. It might become migration depending on, on the circumstances that arrive here, or the circumstances that, uh, that arise in the UK. Future events could turn my movement here to Istanbul into a migration. So, as well as a blending within definitions, definitions themselves being quite unsatisfactory, um, there's also an empirical problem that, that people shift around, people move from one context to another relatively commonly, relatively easily, uh, which also defies this question of definition. Then the question. You started out with a very interesting observation on the importance of the nation state in the work of migration. Yeah. And, and that was quite clear, uh, that was confirmed by, by others. But you made a turn in your presentation, actually suggesting that the nation state is less important than it is made by researchers, while at the end, Joaquin Arango said, oh, uh, let's go back to the one who brought this, this political science into migration studies, Ari Zoberg, our late Ari Zoberg, 1981, bringing back the state in, because it actually does, more than we think, influence both migrations and non-migrations, uh, both settlement processes in all its, its different forms, which actually you seem to confirm in the lot, latter part of your thing, where you say, indexes of, of welfare states, and particularly the institutional ones, are, let's say, uh, uh, should be studied more uh, uh, as, as part of the determining factors. So th th there seemed to be a little bit of a, a difference of opinion. Major, uh, major challenge. Of course, this migration of migration studies uh, brings with it a transplant of, uh, of paradigms, of concepts, of research agendas. And, and my main argument to start with is that, that these Trump transplants are often carried out in a, in a rather superficial way with a good dose of path dependency. They are often uh, policy driven, uh, 
but the, the policy objectives, policy priorities driving these transplants are often not belonging to the local context, but, but are uh, framed and, and defined elsewhere. Uh, trying to make a couple of examples, focusing on, on the European uh, context, which is my main uh, focus, of course. One is, for instance, uh, the relative oblivion of labor migration in Europe over the last few decades after the formal ban on, on, uh, on active uh, labor immigration policies in, in the 70s, uh, other research priorities took, took the fore and uh, targeted research on the labor dimension of, mm -hmm. of uh, migration and on the regulation of this form of migration has been shrinking throughout Europe and this continued, I would say, to be the case even when, in the pre-crisis decade, uh, labor migration surged again, at least in some parts of Europe. Uh, we have I have personally, uh, uh, I'm personally uh, very critical uh, to the ways in which uh, migration studies uh, have been in the last 10 years, especially after 9-11, uh, have mm -hmm. been uh, too much uh, securitized. This is one thing. The second thing, I'm not going to go into detail because uh, Douglas uh, put it very well. The second thing is, of course, together with this uh, politicization of migration. In the European context, uh, the first thing that, of course, uh, comes into one's uh, mind is the, uh, remember the debate about the Polish plumber back in 2004 in the European, mm -hmm. uh, European uh, Constitution uh, referenda in uh, France. Uh, well, I know uh, the total number of the Polish plumbers in France uh, was 143. It was the, Polish, uh, it was the uh, French National uh, Plumbers Association number. So apparently it was not really about the Polish plumbers invading the country. It was rather the politics of fear created and manufactured by the conservative scholars. So sometimes I'm asking myself if the researchers, us, are also falling into this trap contributing to the politicization and securitization of migration uh, debate by only concentrating on the issues related to uh, border protection uh, or uh, national borders, etc. Uh, the the, the, the socioeconomic background of the parents is again 80-90% of the story um, and of the integration success of the immigrant children in the receiving countries. But still there are some puzzles left and this is where much research at the moment in, in Europe is focusing on how to address these group mm -hmm. differences, differences between different groups uh, within given receiving countries differences of specific groups uh, uh, between different receiving countries, uh, so uh, receiving country effects, and we also differ that certain groups do very well with respect to some aspects of, integ uh, of integration, but not so well with respect to others. And that is, so that at the moment there is, I, I think, in, in, the, in, in this field, a, a trend that there, is, there should be more emphasis also on the social and emotional aspects of integration, in, over, in, in order to have yeah. a more comprehensive overall uh, picture of integration. Also because there is some uh, a feeling that, I mean, these complicated causal feedback loops between the structural aspects of integration, educational success of the second generation, and these more social, emotional things, which account for this uh, uh, severe persistence of ethnic uh, inequalities also in the second generation. So I would say Certainly, from the European perspective, thinking about immigration as a foreign policy, it will have to consider the migrant and the migrant journey from end to end. Typically, interior actors get involved once someone has arrived at Europe's borders. Um, humanitarian actors are involved when someone is in distress, and development actors are involved in the motivations and thinking about the context for that journey. How can you bring these actors together to think about a continuum where the individual migrant is considered from the moment they decide they might want to leave to the long-term settlement in a particular country? And that requires a completely different way of thinking about a migration agenda. That starting from uh, maybe very late 90s and early 2000s, we have seen the emergence of a civil society in Turkey that has taken interest in migration issues. I see, to some extent, their Im impact on it. I've also seen domestic politics play 
maybe almost an inconsequential impact on, uh, uh, for example, the policy that the government developed towards Syrian refugees in the context of local politics, lo local elections that came up in March. And already you can see some news reporting and commentary in the media today in Turkey uh, raising the issue of whether these Syrian uh, refugees will be allowed to vote in the upcoming national elections. Employment issues, rent issue, housing issues play a role, but I'm not very sure that it plays at the level, at the level that it does in, uh, Euro in the European Union or in, uh, in, the, in the United States. Again, looking at the last couple of years, you see maybe business taking an interest in it. We saw how in Gaziantep the, uh, the ch uh, ch Chamber of Commerce and the industrial chambers taking an interest in the possibilities of making it possible for employing uh, labor from amongst the Syrian refugees. So there is the beginnings of domestic politics playing, uh, playing a role. Um, as Elizabeth noted, there's quite a call for increasingly evidence-based policies and working in the research unit of IOM. Um, we're constantly trying to promote better data, better evidence, to promote better policies. Um, but unfortunately, often it's difficult to, difficult to communicate this, or, or if it is communicated, as we were discussing yesterday as well, um, if policymakers do sort of understand the issues behind what's driving migration, um, it's not necessarily reflected as much as it could be because of political or domestic um, concerns. I say that um, Turkey-related migration studies uh, so far have not been as significant as they should uh, have been within the context of uh, global migration studies uh, and have not made a theoretical impact as great as they could have made for several reasons. Um, now, erring on the side of overgeneralization, I'm, I want to say that I want to characterize Turkey-related migration studies as being Eurocentric. Eurocentric in the sense that uh, migration studies about Turkey usually focus on um, Turkey from the vantage of point of Western European research questions. Studies. So have studies on Turkey's contributed to theorizing? It depends on how you define theorizing, and we spent the first panel yesterday morning mm -hmm. discussing different levels. Um, sure. But I would say uh, even in some of the more ambitious definitions of what theorizing is, that uh, certainly within the field of, of state citizenship relations and transnational studies, the empirical studies of Turkey have formed such an important part uh, of the work, that, and there is a number of, of theoretical works based on, on this empirical work. I think this room is full of people uh, who are good examples of this, of course, with Professor Soysal's uh, study on post-national citizenship being based on empirical studies of, of Turks in several countries, m one of the um, good examples. And. I remember when we had the transnational communities program at the University of Oxford led by Verdubek and a very large number of the studies on, on transnationalism also included uh, Turks either as the only or as one of the main main case studies including my own fields are. Um, in, in a lot of the readings that I do there are a lot of very interesting theoretical insights that are found in that particular in those particular research projects. The problem is I don't see the next article or the next chapter really building from that particular theoretical insight. Uh, and I think part of it is a technical problem. A lot of those publications are uh, either published as reports or as um, edited books. And I'm, I'm not sure sufficiently this literature that again has been growing and is get, getting better and better is really necessarily known outside of people studying immigration into Turkey. And I think there is a little bit of problem of visibility and communication from outside. And one of the, the, the things that I think would be would, would help a lot the literature is, is to focus more. And not that I don't like, I, I really like edited books and I think 
I, I like to see how different contributions kind of come together. Uh, but I think something that might help the visibility of this particular field would be to do more work on peer-reviewed journals, uh, international journals, so not just Turkish journals. Uh, okay, okay. Rines, may I ask you? Yeah. Because you, in your capacity as research director and also later as a coordinator of IMISCO, you have uh, been interacting with all sorts of institutions, uh, uh, research was commissioned to you or your institute. How do you look at the relation with the external institutions and about the, the, the freedom that you as an academic m may have or should have to do the research that, that you find important? Let me say, as a director of the Institute of Migration and Ethnic Studies, because that, that's the position where this thing comes in most clear, uh, the policy was this one. You, you, you were dependent, as Ahmed said, uh, as an institute of constant funding, and it must come from somewhere. On the other hand, as an institute, you want to have a program, so that means consistency in what you do. It actually means that you look out for all kinds of funding, and some of it come from the ministry, and I brought a network, having worked 10 years from the ministry, a network to get funding there, it's very practical. But at the same time, you have to select. That means some of the topics that the ministry at that moment is interested in fits into the, prior, in, in the priorities of our program. And they say, okay, we'll do this. It adds to what you're doing. You can do it because you're all already in that particular topic. So you try to fit in the, the, the funding, so to speak, uh, within your program. It also means that you say to some of these topics, I don't do this. It, it may be because it doesn't fit into the program. It may also be because the question is not phrased in a, in a relevant way in, in, in our thinking of the program. At the university, we are currently in the UK in a situation where the sort of anti EU anti-immigration discourse prevails uh, throughout society, policy and media, whereas we are constantly called upon to provide expertise, we are also constantly told to be extremely cautious and not to sort of, not to upset the sort of anti immigration lobby uh, who would then focus on a university center like ours which would immediately have uh, repercussions on our funding opportunities on our funders so there is actually a discourse that is so powerful that it undermines our sort of liberty to present our findings in the way we like to talk, to present them at a certain point in time. We are also told, well, you might better wait until after the elections, for example, because it's a too sensitive uh, issue. Okay. Who, who so are you telling that? Diplomacy also affects us. It's different. You know, I'm the director of the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies at the Mecca University of It's the only research center on refugees and migration in all of countries of the southern and eastern Mediterranean. The only one. There are some nascent centers, uh, too, in, in Morocco, Tunisia, and, and, and Institute. And we do not have funds for research. We rely, in fact, on funds coming either from the European Commission or from some foundations, uh, Ford Foundation, or uh, we, w we work w with Fieri, for instance, uh, Ferruccio has left. So there is a, not one university in Egypt, in, in a public university or an, an Arab-speaking university, which has a center for the study of migration. Well, migration is extremely important for the economy and the society of Egypt. So I think you have an imbalance here. You have a real imbalance. If you want to unify the field, you want to have Balanced research. Say thank you to all of you for your presence here, for your contribution. You came 
from near or far to take part into the discussion in this conference. We had uh, various uh, inspiring and enriching debates over these three concepts, borders, mobility, and diversity. We, o we organized this conference on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of Mira Koch, so you share this nice event with us. Uh, for that also, I'd like to say thank you.